Okay, good morning. So let's continue with amino acids, peptides, and proteins. So last time we discussed the structure of amino acids themselves. We mentioned, if I go back, that they contain a carboxylic acid and an amino group. <clears throat> There's an alpha carbon, which typically is a chirality center, except for glycine, in which the R group is also a hydrogen. And then we discussed that nature makes primarily the L type of amino acids for whatever reason nature decided to do that. So what happens with amino acids? The discussion began with me saying that proteins are polymers whose building blocks are amino acids. So what happens is if you consider some generic carboxylic acid reacting with some random amine, what ends up happening between them, <clears throat> you can manage to have them react in such a way that the nitrogen of the amine becomes bonded to the carbonyl of the carboxylic acid, and then the hydrogen of the amine and the OA come together to form water, and in doing so, an amide is what results. Okay, so if, you, if I erase this and you stand back and look, this piece of the carboxylic acid the R, the, the side chain of the, not the side chain, the, the R group of whatever that carboxylic acid is carrying, combined with the portions of the amine minus one hydrogen, these come together and forms an amide. And this is the amide bond that holds them together. And then the OH of the carboxylic acid and the H of the amine will then become water. So technically it's a dehydration process. So in the context of <clears throat> biochemistry and specifically speaking of um, amino acids, because amino acids contain both an amine and a carboxylic acid, what happens is that the carboxylic acid portion of a amino acid will react with the amino portion of a neighboring amino acid. And as we've described on the top, the OH of the carboxylic acid ends up combined with the H of the amine that gives you water. And then the carbonyl portion of that carboxylic acid group on one amino acid ends up bonded to the amino group of the other amino acid. So let me clean this up. This whole portion ends up bonded this whole portion and then these two will end up as water. So the amide bond is formed between these two. And if you notice, here's what you get in the process. This is the amide bond that was formed. This is the carbonyl of the first amino acid. This is the amino group of the second amino acid. And they're joined by this amide linkage. Now, in the context of proteins and amino acids and things of the sort, what is nothing other than an amide functional group is given a special name. It's referred to as a peptide bond. Remember how I mentioned for carbohydrates that carbohydrate biochemists like their own little terminology for things, and they refer to uh, they they call an acetal linkage that joins uh, the alcohols with aldehydes or ketones, they, which is an acetal. They call it a glycosidic bond or a glycoside because typically in the context of sugars. So in this context. Protein biochemists refer to the linkage between two amino acids in the form of an amide bond. They call that a peptide bond. And it's not uncommon to refer to these uh, linked or joined amino acids, however many there may be, to ref be referred to as a peptide, meaning that it contains multiple peptide bonds. In this case, there's only one because it's two amino acids. But as we're going to see, they can get much, much longer and much, much larger. So the amide is the peptide bond. So what I want you to now pay attention to is that the resulting, we call, it as a, we call this a dipeptide, because it can, not because it has two peptide bonds, but because it has two amino acids. This dipeptide turns out still has an amino group on one end, still has a carboxylic group on the other end. So as amino acids combine with each other, they still result in a structure that has a nitrogen on one side and a carboxylic acid on the other, just like the original individual amino acids. So that then what this allows is that additional linkages can occur 
at the end, again, and it can continue again, and it can happen again, and it can happen again, you're still going to end up always with one end having a nitrogen, the other end having a carboxylic acid. And that can keep going and going and going and going. And that's how we're, then we're going to be defining, depending on how many amino acids have come together to form the polymer, is how we classify them. Okay, so upon formation, this is what I was saying, upon formation of a peptide bond, the molecule still has an amino group and a carboxylic acid group. Therefore, this allows for many amino acids to be combined together, and it will form molecules that can be small, depending if it's just a handful, or it can, they can be enormously large, depending if there's hundreds or even thousands of amino acids bonded together. So depending on how many, they're bonded, the amino acids are bonded to the structure is how we classify them. So the terminology is similar to what we discussed with carbohydrates. We talked about monosaccharides, oligosaccharides, polysaccharides. So the same type of terminology applies here. Oligopeptides, typically up to about 10 or so, depending what book you read, they may have different cutoff value, but it's in the ballpark of around 10 is when we refer to it as an uh, oligopeptide. As I mentioned, dipeptide has two amino acids, tripeptide has three amino acids, et cetera, et cetera. Once the peptide has greater than 10, it's typically referred to as a polypeptide. And and this also varies by the author, by the person you're talking to. Um, once you reach an excess of 50, in which the, the structure is enormously large, then at that point is when it's referred to as a protein. These two terms are not uncommonly used interchangeably. So big proteins, some people refer to them as polypeptides because technically they are polypeptides. Um, but again, this author happens to distinguish between a polypeptide, quote unquote, you know, greater than 10, and he specifically refers to the structure as a protein once it reaches a uh, quite large number of amino acids in the structure, okay? So as I've been mentioning, as these peptide bonds form, as these polypeptides start to grow, does it matter how many amino acids have combined, you will always end up with a side or one end that has a nitrogen, and you're going to end up on the other extreme with a side or an end that has a carboxylic acid. So this is why we say that peptides have directionality. So if you follow the, the, the main continuous chain of nitrogen, alpha carbon, carboxylic acid, nitrogen, alpha carbon, carboxylic acid. Now, of course, the carboxylic acids are no longer there. They've, they've reacted with the nitrogen of the next amino acid to form an amide. So in reality, it should be on one end, there's the nitrogen, then there's the alpha carbon, then there's the amide, then there's another alpha carbon, then there's another amide, and so on and so forth, until you reach the other extreme, and that's where you're going to find the last carbon as the, in the form of a carboxylic acid. So this is why when you're describing the structure of a protein, we say that it has directionality. And then we say that one extreme has the amine. We call that the N-terminus. The other extreme has a carboxylic acid, and we call that the C-terminus. Everything in between contains anions, i.e. peptide bonds, plus the alpha carbons, with their corresponding side chains. That is what identifies the specific amino acids that are forming the whole structure. So this is why there's a convention in the scientific community that when you're describing proteins and talking about their structure, you always start by looking at the structure from the N terminus, and then you end up describing it on the C terminus. So it's like when you're, just like we're used to reading things from left to right, and there's the first word, and then there's the period at the end of a sentence. When you're reading or looking at or describing or explaining the or studying the structure of a protein, you always start by looking at it on the N terminus, and then you move down the chain, and then you end looking at it at the C terminus. Okay? Because different amino acids have different side chains, it turns out that the order in which they combine can result in multiple different structures, isomeric structures, that can be produced.
So for example, here's an example. I'm going to zoom in on this one. <clears throat> so if you notice, this amino acid, the, this peptide is a dipeptide. There's only one peptide bond. There's two amino acids. Again, the N terminus. And then as just to be consistent with physiology, remember the nitrogens that are free amines, not, not amide bonds, peptide bonds, but the free amines, always positively charged at physiological pH. That's the N terminus on the far left. And then the C terminus is on the far right. It's the carboxylic acid that's at the other end. Notice how it's deprotonated because this is how it is physiologically. And then as you go from N to C terminus, you'll find again the N terminus, you'll find the alpha carbon of that first amino acid, then you find the peptide bond, which contains the carbonyl of the original carboxylic acid of one amino acid bonded to the nitrogen, i.e. the amino group of the second amino acid. But what you need to pay attention to is that after that peptide bond, there's another alpha carbon. And in between, there's one side chain coming from one amino acid. And here, I'm going to accentuate the fact that the second side chain is a hydrogen. OK? If you were to have drawn this, if, if, the, if the N terminus was glycine and the C terminus was alanine, the structure would be different. So I'm going to draw it here. And it would look like this. And I'm going to purposely draw that um, hydrogen to highlight it. Then comes the peptide bond. Here's the second nitrogen. And then comes <clears throat> um, the alpha carbon of the alanine, which has the methyl group. And then comes the second or last carbon, which is the carboxylic acid. So notice, if I look at this structure this way now, going down what we call the backbone, the first chain that I encounter in this one, if I'm starting from the N terminus, is hydrogen. The first chain I encounter on this one, starting from the N-terminus, is methyl, right? The second chain on the left is hydrogen. The second chain on the left is methyl. So notice how the methyl is now the C, it's associated with the C-terminus, whereas the hydrogen is associated with the N-terminus. These two compounds are different compounds. They actually are constitutional isomers. So depending on which amino acids you have, how many of them you have, and what order they combine, a multitude of different possible structures can be created depending on the order. And that is determined by the positions of these side chains that are technically hanging off what we call this backbone or main frame of the structure. So the order of which these appear in that side chain, in, in that backbone, as you're reading it from N to C terminus, is what we call the primary sequence of the peptide. We're going to get to that. So if you continue going down this slide, you'll notice, again, here is the N terminus, which happens to be alanine. Then there's something in the middle. And then the C terminus over here happens to be serine. The side chain of serine is one of these polar neutral amino acids. Again, the one for glycine is hydrogen, right? If I cross out that little two and make the hydrogen hang there. So methyl, hydrogen, and then technically a primary alcohol, CH2OH, is the sequence from N terminus to C terminus. So here's another one that has five peptides, <clears throat> five amino acids. It's a, it's, a, uh, it's a pentapeptide. There's four peptide bonds. There's always one less pen peptide bond than there are amino acids in the peptide. So again, this is the N-terminus, this is the C-terminus, and then notice there's one peptide, two peptides, three peptides, four peptide bonds. And the sequence, if you start from the N-terminus, it's alanine, it's glycine, it's serine, and then this one happens to be valine. It has a uh, nonpolar side chain, okay? So that's one of multiple possibilities because I've already showed you that when you have two amino acids, they can be the one way or the other. There's only two possible arrangements. But it turns out as you have more and more and more amino acids, the number of possibilities increases exponentially as we're gonna discuss momentarily. So <clears throat> just as these amino acids can come together to form larger structures by way of a peptide bond and water is released in the process, 
It turns out that the opposite reaction, meaning water being utilized to break down the peptide bonds and ultimately release, liberate all of the amino acids from that polymer, this is what's called peptide hydrolysis. So peptides can be hydrolyzed under either acidic or basic conditions in the laboratory. Of course, in biochemistry, everything happens under the guidance of enzymes. Enzymes are themselves proteins whose functions are to carry out multiple things in cellular activity, and their particular function is to catalyze chemical transformations in, in, an, in an efficient manner as opposed to things just happening at random in solution. So hydrolysis, whether it's just done in a laboratory setting under either acidic or basic conditions or in a living system uh, by uh, enzymes, all it does is that it yields the constituent amino acids that that protein or peptide is uh, formed of, right? So this is, a, this is a very important process during digestion when we ingest foodstuffs, typically, let's say, starches and proteins and things of the sort, these substances come into the diet in the form of parts primarily, starches and things of the sort. And when you're eating protein, whether it's uh, meat from animal sources or tofu or, or soybeans or whatever it is from animal protein sources, you're ingesting polymers of amino acids that ultimately get hydrolyzed uh, in the gastrointestinal tract, and that ultimately releases their amino acids that are then absorbed and utilized as the body uh, needs to utilize them. So it turns out that when you look in biochemical systems, proteins and peptides come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. You can have things that are very small that are biologically active. So for example, thyrotropin releasing factor which is coming from the hypothalamus to sort of promote the release of a thyroid hormone from the pituitary is a tripeptide. There's only three amino acids. But then that controls the, uh, the release of thyrotropin, um, another, home, another hormone that happens to be the one that ultimately goes to the, um, to the pituitary to induce production of thyroid hormone itself. Thyrotropin is 201 amino acids, okay? Very, very large protein. Somatostatin, you might have heard about in uh, your physiology. It's actually a, has multiple functions, but one of the important ones is the, that inhibits the release of growth hormone. Growth hormone itself has 191 amino acids. And then um, there's what's known as growth hormone releasing factor, which is, does technically the opposite of somatostatin, which promotes the release of growth, fat, of growth hormone. That one happens to have 44 amino acids. So this is just trying to illustrate that biology takes the amino acids that it has at hand, of which there's about 20, and it utilizes them, puts them in the order that it needs to, produces a structure that carries or is able to deliver a particular function, and that's what it does, and that's how those things ultimately uh, do their job. So some of the digestive enzymes are actually pre-produced in an inactive form. Chymotrypsinogen, there's another one that's called trypsinogen, there's pepsinogen. The, the, this ending inogen is suggestive of that the structure is in an inactive form. And whenever the enzyme needs to be activated so that it carries out its ultimate physiological function, then some pieces of it are hydrolyzed away, they're chopped off. So in this case, the active enzyme chymotrypsin has 241. So notice there's a difference of four amino acids that are removed. And by removal of these four amino acids, that ultimately changes the structure of the chymotrypsinogen, which is inactive, to the active uh, chymotrypsin, which is then the one that can ultimately carry out the uh, physiological function of digesting proteins, okay? So different enzymes, different digestive enzymes in particular, actually are able to recognize particular structural features of the proteins that we ingest. So chymotrypsin, for example, has the ability to scan the structures of proteins, and it's looking for aromatic side chains, side chains that contain arenes. And when it finds that piece, it's going to then chop it up 
it's going to hydrolyze that specific peptide bond and then notice this piece has now been separated from that piece and then other enzymes that have different structures and different functions will come in and then recognize other types of side chains and things of the sort ultimately the whole protein gets hydrolyzed into individual amino acids and that's how uh, these foodstuffs are ultimately absorbed into the circulation okay so just as we discussed uh, how individual amino acids because of their amino group on one end and their carboxylic acid group on the other end in the case of an amino acid the amino and carboxylic acid are both directly attached to that alpha carbon we also discussed how the side chain that's coming off of that alpha carbon if it has acidic or basic functionalities amino groups carboxylic acid groups etc they can also respond to changes in pH and that has an effect on the net charge of these structures so when you have peptides multiple amino acids bonded to each other because they still have an amino group because they still have a carboxylic acid group and now it turns out if they have multiple amino acids for forming these structures they can have multiple different side chains each with their own specific acid base properties that will also respond to changes in pH now you have to sort of come back and consider what happens to the whole structure as a whole when pH changes from being on the acidic side being neutral being on the basic side etc cetera, etc cetera. so let's look at these structures that are here so that you can sort of analyze what's happening over here and just being mindful of the uh, you know approximate pKa's of these uh, functionalities we're function we're obviously focusing on things that are acidic or basic so again if you have a really low pH pH 1 right so what happens at low pH the amino group is going to be protonated the carboxylic acid group on the C terminus is going to be protonated so N terminus and C terminus are both protonated that means that this amino has a positive charge it means that this carboxy group has a neutral charge but now you have a side chain that happens to be basic so that one's going to add an, uh, an additional positive charge if you happen to have a let's say uh, a spartic acid group here carboxylic acid on the side chain of the C terminus amino acid then that one will also be protonated will also be neutral so the net charge at that particular pH because these two are positive and positive is going to be plus two okay so what happens if you increase the pH and you bring it close to neutrality so what happens is that both carboxylic acids now are going to be deprotonated they're going to have a charge of minus one but at physiological pH amino groups are protonated so these now are still going to be positively charged notice that these two positives technically cancel each other out with those two negatives the net charge of the whole peptide this is a tripeptide this one will have a zero charge so at that point it's a perfect zwitter ion now in the larger context of having multiple amino groups multiple carboxylic acid groups that's the pH about which it's going to have a neutral charge if you go to the end of the spectrum with pH and you now go to a very basic pH what's going to happen so the amino groups are going to be deprotonated so they're going to have no charge but our carboxylates are going to continue to exist as carboxylates minus one minus one so the whole thing has a charge of negative two so notice the whole point of this discussion is that you notice that as pH transitions from one so so let's say from really low passing through neutrality going to really high the charge goes from being highly positive eventually makes zero and eventually makes negative and this is just one example with these two amino acids if you look on the right side doing the same analysis with a uh, tripeptide that has only amino groups in the side chains it's a very different charge profile and transition between charges for that particular peptide because again pH 1 positive 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 this is zero so this is going to have a charge of plus 3 
okay? If you go to neutrality, positive, 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 this is now negative one. So the negative cancels with one of the positives. This is gonna have a charge of plus two. If you go all the way to pH 14, all of the amino groups have no charge. The carboxylate will be minus one. So now you've managed to get to a minus one charge. So notice how the profile is very different, right? So th the point of this discussion is that different peptides, different proteins at a particular pH may have a different net charge depending on which amino acids make up that particular protein. The combination of all of the amino acids that a structure, a protein structure contains and their ability to change their structure in terms of protonation, deprotonation, charge changes, depending on pH is what's gonna ultimately determine what's the net charge on the structure. And ultimately net charge is gonna enormous influence on the actual three-dimensional shape of the proteins because things that are have a particular combination of charges versus something different that has a different combination of charges, that's going to lead to different abilities to ultimately reach a particular three-dimensional shape as we're gonna discuss, okay? All right, this slide got really messy. So let's go on to the next one. All right, so this is what I've been saying, right? The net charge of peptides is important in the shape, in the shape that they have. This is what I was saying. Turns out that charge also has a very enormous effect on water solubility. So things that are highly charged are more water soluble. Things that are less charged are less water soluble. It turns out that when the water solubility of a protein changes precipitously, precipitation of that protein can occur because if it's no longer having sufficient magnitude of charge that allows that structure to be dispersed within an aqueous medium, the proteins are gonna wanna aggregate with each other and they're gonna crash out of solution just like oil doesn't dissolve in water. And it turns out one of the consequences of changes in bodily fluid pH, even if it's a subtle change, uh, whether it's going towards the basic side or the acidic side, uh, it's largely lethal and detrimental to the sustenance of life. It's largely because the structures of the proteins that make up everything in the human body and the structures of these proteins that are carrying out all of the physiological functions can be compromised if their structure is compromised and pH has an enormous influence in that outcome. So when we have patients going into the intensive care unit because they are acidotic or alkalotic and what have you, and, and, they're, and they're in grave danger, it's because it's the proteins in their bodily fluids, in their cells, in their structures of their body, that because the state of protonation and their charge is changing, they no longer can do their function as they should, and that's what ultimately can lead to death, okay? All right, so this is just asking to draw a dipeptide um, phenylalanine, cysteine, and then again, when we're reading these things, this is always the N-terminus, this is always the C-terminus, right? So again, you need to be, you're not gonna be drawing anything, obviously, but you need to be able to recognize these things. So you're always gonna have the amino end on one end, then comes the alpha carbon, which always has a CH, and then comes the uh, carboxylic acid, meaning the C-terminus of the first amino acid, then comes the N-terminus of the second amino acid, then comes the alpha chain of the second amino acid, and in this case, we've reached the C-terminus. Okay, so the first side chain is phenylalanine, which is CH2, and then there's an aromatic ring over here, right? And then the um, second one is cysteine, which is CH2SH, okay? So this one is nonpolar. This one is polar neutral. 
okay? Neutral. Here's the N terminus. Here's the C terminus. So we refer to cysteine as the C terminal amino acid. We refer to phenylalanine as the N terminal amino acid. This one only has two. So it's one and the other, right? If you have many, many, many amino acids, then there's only one N terminal and one C terminal. Everything in between is just amino acids in the middle, right? But when you're referring to the one that's directly associated, bonded, is part of the N-terminal amino acid, you simply look at the side chain and see what that is. That's the amino acid you're referring to. When you're looking at the C-terminus, what's the amino acid of the C-terminus? Okay, let me move one carbon over and look at its side chain. That's the amino acid. It's called cysteine. Anything else in between is what it is. And then, of course, the uh, peptide bond is in the center over here, right? That came from the formation of that amide group between the C terminus of what was phenylalanine and the N terminus of what was uh, cysteine. Okay? All right. Well, I mean, we're not going to ask you to memorize the names and the structures of the amino acids, but you need to be able to look at the structures and identify, again, whether it's nonpolar, polar neutral, um, and, you know, have an idea as to, as to how they're bonded and things of the sort. All right, so now we're going to talk about the different levels of structure that a uh, protein can attain. So I already alluded to primary structure. We're going to talk about secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure, which is the different levels of structural arrangement in proteins. So let's start defining these different levels. Before we do that, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some other levels of classification of uh, proteins. So in terms of three-dimensional shape and structure, uh, proteins can be largely classified as either being fibrous, and as the name implies, these proteins are existing in the form of long fibers or strings, and we have several of these proteins in our body. These are actually the most abundant proteins by mass in the human body. The two most abundant ones are collagen, which make up the bulk of most of our connective tissue, and then keratin is the structure of hair. We're going to talk about the details of these structures as we go through this discussion. So these are like rope-like structures, enormous tensile strength, highly insoluble in water. You want them to be that way? Hold on one second. Um, sorry, I, I was interrupted there for a minute. So you want these proteins to be that way, tensile strength and um, insoluble in water, because the last thing you want is your, your proteins and your bones and your cartilage and all these things to be dissolving, and then we won't be able to stand up and anything of the sort, right? So... Um, this is a very important feature. We're going to talk about the structural components that make this happen. And then there are globular proteins, globular proteins. And these proteins are uh, spherical in shape. They are formed as um, amino acids form the, 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 the body of the, of the protein, and then they ultimately fold on themselves, and they form these, you know, Spherical, I mean, I can't find another word other than spherical. We're going to look at pictures in a minute. So they're highly folded, highly folded. And then they're folded in such a way that their outer portions are where most of the charged amino acids or polar amino acids will exist. And then towards their interior is where they hide, if you will, they protect all of the more nonpolar or less polar amino acids, because then that is what ultimately is going to make the protein water soluble. Okay. So these globular proteins are very, very important in terms of carrying out the functions that happen throughout cells. So fibrous proteins serve mostly structural functions, collagen, keratin, our muscle proteins, actin and myosin, those are fibrous proteins. They are carrying out, giving muscle structure. They, 
it turns out that that one also carries out function because muscle uh, motion is also uh, a function. But globular proteins are these little spherical balls of protein, if you will, floating around your bodily fluids, carrying out a specific function. So enzymes, for example, are primarily amongst the class of globular proteins. If you look in the human body, globular proteins are the most abundant in terms of numbers. So there's many more globular proteins in the human body than there are fibrous proteins. But the quantity, the mass, the total mass of the globular proteins is far less than the fibrous proteins. So as I started to talk about, there are different layers or levels of organization of protein structure. What we call primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. So we're going to now start defining these different levels. So as I mentioned, amino acids are going to be forming these peptide bonds. And if you follow the backbone, the mainframe, there's technically three atoms in the peptide that are always repeating right it's the nitrogen of whatever it doesn't matter part there's a nitrogen there's the alpha carbon and then there's the carbonyl and this is what repeats this is the repeating unit so this is going to be bonded to another nitrogen another alpha carbon and another there's an ch here right with an r group and this is going to be bonded to something else this typically has an h as well right so but if you if you if you bring it to the bare bones to analyze it, the main atoms of the fame of the main frame are nitrogen, the alpha carbon, and then the carbon of what forms the carbonyl. And this is the repeating unit, and it repeats again and again and again and again. What is different is what R group is bonded to that particular alpha carbon as you progress down the chain. Okay, so as that structure keeps growing and growing and growing, the peptide that grows, all of these atoms that are forming this uh, large elongated structure, they ultimately start interacting with each other in three dimensions. Okay, so it's like a string. Imagine a string that as the string gets longer and longer and you start stretching it, well, if it's stretched, it's not really going to interact with itself. But if you sort of fold it, it's going to start interacting with itself. So this is what happens. These growing peptide chains will adopt a very unique three-dimensional structure that is going to be entirely the result of the interactions through space. So it's interparticle interactions, intermolecular interactions. The interactions can either be from portions of the structure that are close to each other, or it turns out it can be from portions of the structure that are far away from each other, depending on how the protein folds on itself. Okay, So the interactions associated with adjacent or nearby portions only involve that backbone or mainframe. Okay? And that interaction only involves hydrogen bonding. <coughs> We're going to look at structures and pictures in a minute. The moment distant pieces of the protein start interacting with each other, it's largely by way of the side chains that are interacting with each other. And because we have different types of side chains, which can either be nonpolar, which would interact via London dispersion forces, they can be polar neutral, and that would lead to dipole-dipole or hydrogen bonding type interactions. They can be acidic or basic, which means they have charges, and that would lead to ionic interactions. And it turns out there is a fourth one that can actually happen, which is actually covalent bonding between one part of the protein and another part of the protein, typically by what we call disulfide bonds. It can also be mediated by metal ions. So disulfide bonds would be that the side chain of a cysteine amino acid, which has a, a thiol functionality, turns out to find the same type of side chain from another distant location. And then they ultimately will bind to each other and will form what is known as a disulfide bond. <clears throat> 
trying to mimic it here. So here's a SS, two sulfurs bonded to each other covalently. That is known as a disulfide bond. So disulfide bonds are exceedingly important in all sorts of places in biochemical structures to hold them together, primarily proteins. There's other examples as well. And that sort of helps distant pieces of the, pro of the protein to covalently bond to themselves and hold everything in place. Turns out these bonds are quite sturdy, but they're not impossible to break. These bonds can be broken down and then the structure can return to the uh, individual cysteines. This is typically associated with a denaturing process as we're gonna learn. You, talked to, you learned about this in the lab, uh, in the protein lab. Um, metal ions, also very important to hold things together. So it turns out, we've talked about this briefly before, uh, you must, as part of your diet, take in a whole bunch of uh, trace minerals. Many of them are um, heavy metal ions. So things like iron and zinc and copper and manganese, and the list keep, keeps going. So um, these metal ions, most or much of, what, of the function of what they do is they end up being incorporated into proteins and in doing so the side chains of amino acids coming from the structure of the protein will form uh, covalent bonds with these metal ions and that will also impart the structure with a unique and, and important and specific three-dimensional shape that the protein needs to be able to carry out its function so these types of interactions, the combination of them, is what then ultimately leads to a protein having its final necessary structure to be able to do its job. So we're going to go through the different levels as we go through this discussion. So I already mentioned this. I'll expand on that. A, uh, the proteins, a protein's primary structure is none other than the sequence of amino acids based on the side chains that are carried by that alpha carbon in whatever order they are. So if you look at these peptides down here, this would be the N terminus, this would be the C terminus, this is the N terminus, this is the C terminus, and so on and so forth. I'm just gonna label these three, right? So if you notice, these are the same three amino acids, alanine, glycine, and valine. And notice, you can put them together in whatever order, six different ways, okay? Six different ways. So three amino acids can lead to the production of six different peptides. And because the order of the side chains is different, the, the overall structures of these peptides are different, and therefore potentially they have different three-dimensional shapes, and ultimately that translates to different functions, okay? I mean, these are just tripeptides, there's not much here, but when you're talking about proteins, the specific order of the amino acids, however many there are there, that's what ultimately imparts that protein with its ultimate three-dimensional shape, and that's what gives it its ultimate function. So just to continue with this discussion, if you have five amino acids, we're not showing you those because there's up to 120 possibilities, okay? So this is just illustrating the enormous diversity of structures that can be generated. And again, this is five, right? We mentioned that proteins, what we truly call a protein, contains 50 or greater. We're talking an enormous number of possibilities of structures and each of those based on their structure has the potential to carry out a specific and unique function okay so again primary structure or primary sequence those terms are synonymous is simply the order at which the amino acids are bonded together starting from the n terminus all the way to the c terminus so if you imagine the 20 amino acids analogous to the 26 letters of the alphabet, okay? Depending on which letters you pick and what order you put them in, you can put together 
the entire English language and we every word depending on the letters and the order has a unique meaning right so look at it that way however many amino acids however in, in whatever order they are put in that has a unique function right so just like each word has a meaning each collection of amino acids produces a structure that has a unique function so this is just a little cartoon here simply illustrating let me zoom in here for a minute again the primary structure of a protein so you start assuming this is the end terminus over here right and over here it's the c terminus so it's number one and number two and number three and you're just going down the chain down the chain all of these are amino acids you're, this when you're talking about what's the order you're describing the primary sequence or the primary structure here they're zooming in right and they're showing you this one in particular right this is just phenylalanine so again what's on there technically the R group of phenylalanine is hanging off of that. The amino group of that is bonded to the previous amino acid. The carboxylic acid is bonded to the next amino acid. Okay, so it's just the order. That's all you need to be concerned with when you're describing primary sequence of proteins. All right, so here is a little cartoon trying to illustrate the uh, sequence of insulin. And insulin, of course, as we know, is a very important, turns out it's a hormone, and it's uh, critically important for uh, a glucose uh, homeostasis and metabolism. And um, insulin has 51 amino acids. It turns out it's two different chains that are bonded to each other. One shown here in purple, right? The second one shown in sort of a dark blue color. And it turns out, they are bonded covalently to one another via several disulfide bonds that holds it all in place. But if you if you pay attention to the two chains, this is the considered to be the end terminus of that protein. It happens to be phenylalanine. And then notice valine, asparagine, glutamine, his, uh, histidine, et cetera, et cetera. And then you keep going and going and going. The C terminus is threonine down here, right? That's one piece. The second piece starts here at glycine and keeps going isoleucine, valine, yada, 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 goes all the way. And then the end terminus is that, I think that was asparagine down there, right? So the primary sequence, again, is simply amino acid number one, number two, number three, number four, yada, 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 all the way until you get to the end. Interestingly, 51 amino acids, 2.3 times 10 to the 66 possibilities okay well there's a unique sequence that produces the structure that is insulin and it has to be the amino acids in that particular order joined in this particular way because otherwise you don't have insulin you have something else that doesn't do what insulin is supposed to do so nature has that power to put things together in the way that it has to that it needs to so that the structure that results, which is entirely the result of the order that things were bonded, that structure that results from that is what then is going to be able to carry out whatever function it that needs to be carried out. Okay. All right. So here's a, an interesting uh, example for those of you who are in the nutrition program. Um, aspartame, which is the blue stuff. This is um, originally trademarked as equal. It's now just the blue stuff. Um, again, aspartame is what it's called uh, in, in the common name. If you, it's actually a dipeptide, and if you realize the structure, uh, here's the N terminus, right? Technically, this is the C terminus. The C terminus has actually been modified to ester linkage over here. Technically, a methanol molecule has been incorporated into that structure, but you can see this is a aspartic acid, and this is a phenylalanine over here, right? So the name aspartame comes from the fact that it contains aspartic acid as the end terminus. Now, if you realize, um, look at the structure that's next to it, that's the one in which the two amino acids have been reversed. So the end terminus is now phenylalanine and the C terminus is now aspartic acid aspartate at physiological pH, right? Because the carboxylate is the carboxylic acid is, is deprotonated. Well, it turns out, as we all know, 
if you've ever if you consume these products. Um, aspartame is sweet. This is how it was it was discovered as a sweet substance and then marketed and, and somebody made billions with that, right? Um, if you simply swap these two, guess what? It's not sweet. It's uh, it's something else. It doesn't have the ability to interact with your taste buds in the manner that this one does. Why? Well, because its structure is different. Things are in a different order, right? Just like your hands fit in a glove in a particular way, if you were to, again, don't even think about this, but if you were to put your thumb where your, where your middle finger is and put your pinky where your thumb was, you have a different structure. It's not going to fit. It's a different thing. And it can't do the job, right? Your hands have a particular design of the four larger fingers and the smaller finger and the particular order that they are because they're meant to carry specific functions. If you start swapping things, it's not going to be able to do the function because it doesn't have the right structure. Right, so it's the same type of analysis over here, and in this case, it's something interacting with your taste buds. If it doesn't fit the right way and it doesn't interact the right way because it doesn't have the right structure, then it can't do the job that it's meant to do. All right, so that's primary sequence, which can, as we have, as we've just illustrated, can have an enormous uh, consequence in terms of overall function. Right, so the next layer is what we call secondary structure. So as the protein is growing and growing and growing and the amino acids start to, you know, become part of this R entity, what happens is that as it's growing, it starts to fold on itself, right? It's like a piece of spaghetti, right? That if you look in a pot of spaghetti and the spaghetti is boiling, all those strands of spaghetti, they're not, they're not straight like logs as they were when they were dry. No, they're now sort of folded and convoluted amongst themselves and whatever. So what happens with these strands of protein as they grow, they start interacting and folding upon themselves, right? So in the in the short term, in the meaning in when they're close, the, the portions that are close to one another, they start interacting with each other and Two types of, pro of, of structures can arise, again, talking about portions of the, of the primary structure that are close to each other. So the first one is what we call an alpha helix, and that's simply a coil. So again, imagine taking a little piece of string and wrapping it around your finger, right? So you start at one end and then it starts wrapping and it starts wrapping and it starts wrapping and you form this like a slinky type of thing, right? So what happens is that as it wraps, the nitrogens that have a hydrogen, let me zoom in on this thing. We're going to see another picture as well in a, in a slide or two. The hydrogen that has a, uh, a hydrogen on it, the nitrogen that has a hydrogen on it, as the structure loops around and wraps around itself, has the ability to form hydrogen bonds with the carbonyl oxygen that is along the backbone several amino acids away. Remember, the backbone is nitrogen with a hydrogen plus the alpha carbon with whatever the R group is plus the carbonyl. And this keeps going. There's another hydrogen with an H and there's another alpha carbon, let's call this R1 and R2 because they're typically different, and another carbonyl over here. So what ends up happening is that as this folds on itself, this hydrogen, let's say, wraps around and starts interacting with the lone pairs on the carbonyl that's several amino acids away. Turns out it's about four amino acids away. It starts wrapping around and this wraps around and, and touch this, and here's another one touching that one, and here's another one touching that one, and here's another one touching that one. So what that does is that it creates a framework of a coil, and what holds the coil together is the is these bunches of amino of of um, hydrogen bonds that are forming along that that secondary structure is what we call it. Okay, we're going to see better pictures in a minute. The second possibility is that two strands of the protein as it's growing will align themselves with each other. So this would be like two spaghettis sort of align, stretching themselves out and touching each other sideways and, tit, and the net 
comes in and the other one comes in and the other one comes in. So it's like a, like a sheet. They form a sheet, okay? And what forms the floor or, or the body of the sheet is the individual strands that are side by side by side by side. We call that a beta pleated sheet, okay? It's what it's called. And again, what holds it together is a nitrogen finding a carbonyl and another carbonyl finding a nitrogen and another nitrogen finding a carbonyl and another carbonyl finding nitrogen and so on and so forth. It's like a zipper. Imagine two pieces coming together and the hydrogen bonds from one end to the other, right? That's what technically holds it together, okay? So we'll, we'll look at better pictures in a minute. So let's talk about the alpha helix. I'm gonna zoom out so that we can look at the content of the slide. So again, the alpha helix is this little coil that forms. So imagine this is the N terminus and this is the C terminus over here, right? So then as, it's, as it forms, it coils and coils and coils on itself. And it's the NH bonds and the CO bonds and the NH bonds and the CO bonds and the NH bonds and the CO bonds that are aligned sort of parallel. If you imagine a line going down the middle of the coil, if it's the string wrapping around your finger, it's your finger is the, is the axis that's going down the middle. And then along the string, as it's wrapping around your finger, imagine little hydrogen bonds forming parallel to your finger along the stretch of the string as it's coiling and coiling and coiling and coiling, okay? That's what we call an alpha helix. Turns out that that sort of imparts these proteins with a certain flexibility, right? It's sort of like a springy type of a, of, a, of a structural feature that it imparts it. And again, it's hydrogen bonds entirely from NH and CO bonds along the primary structure, along the backbone, okay? The framework, the main frame, not the side chains, but it's the backbone where these interactions are happening. Turns out that the, the, the R groups, the side chains are actually sticking out from the body of this coil, okay? They're coming out, outside. What's holding it together is things that are happening within the body of the coil, coming entirely from the backbone. Here's another little picture that we pulled off of the internet, right? So again, if you imagine this is the N terminus and down here is the C terminus, follow the green, right? Let me see if I can change this to green. There's sort of a greenish color here, right? So imagine here it's going this way and it's going this way and it's wrapping around, it's wrapping around. And then notice this green, you can't barely see it. Here's a hydrogen bond. Here's another one, here's another one, here's another one. Imagine the axis going vertically, right? Those hydrogen bonds are parallel to that axis. Notice how these R groups are sticking out like th little thorns coming out from, their, their, from the body of the, of, the, of the coil, okay? So for example, wool, wool, everybody knows wool, right? It's a, it's a uh, fabric, actually it comes from animals, it turns out, right? Sheep and other things. Wool is an example of a protein. Protein, wool is a type of hair. It's a hair, right? Pretty much. It's a type of hair that is very rich in alpha helices. This is why wool, you can stretch it, right? If you've ever had anything made of wool, you can sort of stretch it. Right? It's a stretchy fabric, right? <coughs> it's because it has, uh, its proteins have many of these uh, alpha helices as part of its structure. Here's the beta pleated sheet, and there's two types, <coughs> excuse me, what we call parallel or anti-parallel. And what that means is the manner in which the strands that make up the sheet actually align themselves with each other. So the parallel um, typically happens, and, and let me just clarify, I, I gave the analogy of spaghetti, individual strands lining up next to each other. That's one possibility. We're going to talk about that when we talk about collagen in a slightly different context. But it can also be one very large, very long uh, protein that simply sort of 
like a heating coil. I don't know if you've seen these things, not a coil, but I don't know how to describe it. But so the strand goes in one direction and then kind of wraps around itself and then it continues going in that direction and then wraps around itself and continues going in that direction and wraps around itself like that. So then it's these pieces and these pieces. Let me change to the color blue because it's going to make more sense. I'll do this again very, very quickly. Oops change colors so then it, it goes this way and then it wraps around and then it wraps around again and it wraps around again and it wraps around again but it's not coil it's just that these long strands will then interact with each other and 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 it forms these long sheets that will ultimately do that so why do we call it parallel it's called parallel because the pieces that ultimately end up aligning with each other, they're going from N to C, from N to C, right? I'm going to do this again. Now I'm going to do it in red again. It goes like this, and it goes like this, from N to C, from N to C. And this arranges with that, and this associates with that. So parallel means that the strand will arrange itself with the pieces that form the sheet, they're all going from N terminus to C terminus, the next one N terminus to C terminus. They're all parallel, going in the same direction. The alternative, of course, is anti-parallel. This is the one that's easier to visualize because technically what's happening is that it's going like this and 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 like this, right? Here's the N terminus. Let's say the the C terminus ends there. So then what happens is that this associates with that through hydrogen bonds and this with this and this with this and this with this and this with this, right? And it forms this long sheet. But they're anti-parallel because this is the C terminus over here, right? And then it's sort of in the opposite direction, right? So here's, um, if you look at it, it goes from N to C and from C to N and from C to N and from M to C, right? So here's N to C and here's, um, and to see this way. It's better to see it on the top over here, right? All right. So again, going this way and going that way and going that way and going that way, and this associates with this and this associates with that, but they're going in opposite directions like this, like that, like that, like that. All right. So that would be anti parallel. So different proteins utilize different types of secondary structure. In fact, in the same protein, you can have multiple locations that have different secondary structure. So the first few amino acids of the primary sequence will associate with themselves, let's say, forming an alpha helix. And then the structure continues, and then the next 30 amino acids are going to form a uh, parallel beta sheet. And then continues down the primary sequence and then you know amino acids 69 through 123 are going to form a parallel beta beta I mean it, it varies right so it depends on the on the protein but the point is secondary structure whether it's alpha helix or beta pleated sheet always involves adjacent or close areas along the primary sequence so if you notice how we've described this I'm going back for a minute Again, it's the it's the, it's the coil, but it's it's formed by regions that are immediately following each other, right? Here, again, this piece immediately follows that one. That one immediately follows that one. That one immediately follows that one. And if you look at the beta, at the anti-parallel, again, like this, like this, like this, like this. These areas are close to each other. These are close to each other. These are close to each other. These little pieces here that form these turns, they're called beta turns or hairpins, depending on who you talk to. So it's what forms the turn or the twist of the structure that allows it to form these, uh, these uh, beta pleated sheets. Here's another structure of uh, uh, probably a more artistic one of beta pleated sheets. Again, notice here's one strand. This one happens to be anti-parallel if you notice the arrows over here, right? So here's one strand, here's the second strand and notice the amino, the uh, hydrogen bonds forming between the adjacent strands. This would then technically wrap around again this way and have another layer over here, and it would wrap around that way, have another layer over here, and these two would be interacting, right? So it turns out, look at it here sort of in a sideways view, right? What happens to the R groups? Well, in the alpha helix, in the alpha helix, the R groups were sticking out sort of towards the outside. Well, in the beta pleated sheet, 
the R chains that are in the alpha carbons are pointing either upward or downward. Again, they are not participating in the hydrogen bonds that are being formed here and here and here and here. They're not. Notice here they're going up, right? Or down. The hydrogen bonding network that holds it together is part of the main frame or backbone. The R groups have nothing to do with that. So an example of a protein that exhibits um, beta pleated sheet is silk. Silk is a protein. As uh, most of you probably know, it's a produced in a, in a quite tragic fashion um, by uh, tricking the poor um, silkworm to think that it's perpetual daylight by shining light on them and then they just continue working and working and working until they exhaust themselves and then they're no longer with us at that point. Um, it's, it's quite tragic, but anyway. But that's how silk is produced and is harvested from these from these animals. And uh, silk, if you've ever had silk or any or you have anything that's made of silk, it's not stretchy. It's quite sturdy. And if you pull on it too strongly, then it can rip. It's going to break because beta pleated sheets, unlike uh, alpha helices, are not flexible. They're they're quite sturdy, and again, they serve particular functions um, because of their sturdiness. Okay. All right, so in the few minutes that we have, I will introduce, we have about 10 minutes. I think we're probably gonna get to this whole discussion um, of, of protein structure, but I'll talk about tertiary structure, which is the next level, right? So once the primary sequence has been produced and the regions of that sequence that are close to one another form these secondary structural elements, alpha helices, beta pleated sheets. There's actually others that we're not talking about that are sort of related to those, but these are the basic ones. Once those structures have formed, then what happens? Well, the, what happens is that all of those secondary structural elements will then be able to, through space, through three-dimensional space, they're going to find each other, they will interact with one another. So imagine the human body, again, you have your left arm and your right arm and your fingers and your hand form, that's trying to, I'm trying to represent here, that as being a, the secondary structural elements and the other hand is another stru secondary structural element. Well, if you bring your hands together above your head, right, and you, and you clasp your hands with one another and you hold them tight, what has happened is that two portions of your body, which are far away from one another, anatomically speaking, you have managed to bring them together and one will latch onto the other, right? And this is what tertiary structure is about. So once these primary elements have formed and they've given themselves some structure by folding upon themselves in close proximity, that's what produces the secondary structural elements, alpha, beta, uh, uh, alpha helices, beta pleated sheets. Once those pieces suddenly start finding each other in three dimensions, they don't have to be close to one another. They can be very distant along the entire primary sequence. But if they fold upon themselves and they start interacting with themselves, then that is what ultimately produces what we call tertiary structure. So this is the ultimate three-dimensional shape that the protein will acquire, and it results when the st secondary structurals, structural elements that form along the path of the primary sequence assemble with each other in three-dimensional space. So this little cartoon that you see here is trying to illustrate a fully formed protein that has its fully acquired three-dimensional shape, i.e. its tertiary structure. So notice, there's portions of the structure that have alpha helix. That one's a long one. Here's a short one. And then if you notice, there's also a reasonably large beta pleated sheet, right? Notice how the large alpha helix is sort of resting on that beta pleated sheet. And then the smaller alpha helix is sort of interacting with another portion of the beta pleated sheet. And that's what ultimately gives the protein its ultimate shape, okay? So 
the primary sequence is the sequence that folds on itself in close proximity, gives you the secondary structural elements, alpha helices, beta pleated sheets, how those ultimately find themselves in three dimensions and gives the whole thing its ultimate structure, that's what is called tertiary structure. So what holds things together, let me just go back for one second. The only way a protein will be able to carry out its function is if it has ultimately attained the correct tertiary structure. If the secondary structural elements don't form properly, and if ultimately the tertiary structure doesn't form properly, meaning everything has to fall into place, everything has to find itself in the right way, then the protein is non-functional, right? So there are, there are innumerable mechanisms and, and one of the major functions of physiology and, and biochemistry is to ensure that every single protein that your body produces is first, the sequence is correct, that the secondary structural elements fold properly, and once they form, that the ultimate three-dimensional shape is attained, because if that doesn't happen, then we wouldn't be having this conversation, right? All right. So what is it that holds everything together? So in the case of tertiary structure, it's beyond bonds, because what actually is involved in establishing and holding everything together the tertiary structure is the amino acid side chains, okay? It's the side chains. Remember, they were pointing out of the alpha helices. They were pointing above and below the beta pleated sheets. So when those elements come together, pretty much all that's left to interact with another structure is the side chains that are sticking out of these things like thorns. And then, of course, the ones that have sort of a certain affinity for each other are the ones that are going to find themselves and interact with one another. So all of the pieces that are nonpolar are going to want to be together. All of the side chains that are polar but don't have a charge, whether it's dipole-dipole interactions or hydrogen bonds, they're going to want to be together. All of the pieces that have a charge, because opposite charges will attract each other, anything that has a positive charge, some amino group, some carbox, uh, something of the sort, will look for a negative charge on a carboxylic acid side chain like aspartate and glutamate, and those are going to find each other. So it turns out the distance between the portions that interact, when you look at them through the eye of the primary sequence, they can be at any position, at any distance, they do not have to be anywhere close to each other. And as I've been saying, the like dissolves like in type of interactions is what's going to determine what is going to ultimately find, what piece is going to find the other piece, right? And then as I mentioned, there's also the covalent bonds, whether it's disulfide bonds to metal ions that ultimately secure the structure. So let me zoom into this picture. We have about another two minutes. I just want to sort of use this one, and then there's another one that I'm going to show you. We'll finish with tertiary structure today. So if you pay attention to this structure, notice this is just trying to illustrate. Here we have a piece of an alpha helix. Here's a piece of a beta pleated sheet. Right? These will ultimately interact with each other through their surface side chains of the amino acids, and it's going to be in terms of whatever compatibility they have. Notice how metal ions can simply serve as anchor points between parts of the chain. And let me say, not every portion of a protein adopts secondary structure. You can have a piece of an alpha helix and then a piece of nothing. It's just kind of random. And then you have a beta pleated sheet and then some more randomness. So here's some randomness that happens to be held in a particular orientation by way of this metal ion. Here's a little portion in which nonpolar amino acids have found themselves. We call that hydrophobic interactions. Here's a disulfide bond, covalent bond that formed between two cysteines. Here's what we called, a here, here's a hydrogen bond, right? Here's a carbonyl of something with an OH of something else. Here's an ammonium and a carboxylate. They find each other and they will interact with each other. Let's look at this picture, and then this is the last slide of the day. So here's another one, right? Trying to illustrate these concepts. 
So here call a, uh, a hydrogen bonding interaction as we've, as we've seen them. Here's another one. A salt bridge, which is what we call the interaction between a carboxylate, which is negative, and ammonium that is positive. Here's two nonpolar amino acids interacting with each other. Here's two more, right? Here's disulfide bonds. Notice this is alpha helix. This is another alpha helix. This is another alpha helix. But it's all held together in this big blob, if you will, of three-dimensional shape by the combination of all of these interactions. This is what produces tertiary structure, OK? All right, so it's 12.15. That is it for today. We will continue next Tuesday. Everybody have a great weekend, and please be safe.